City Light Cross Style uh, Conference. So um, we were to be down there for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but uh, the COVID thing and all that's going on uh, kind of prohibited that. So at the last minute, we didn't cancel it. We did it online. So by Zoom, uh, Friday, we were online with the conference, and then all day yesterday, we were online with the conference. Uh, Nathan Johnson, which some of you know, was uh, part of that conference as well. And uh, it was, it's, a lot of it is focused on our Africa people as well, because we have all of these cross-style centers all over Africa. And uh, we did it Friday afternoon, because for Africa, uh, evening is like two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> So the time change and all that. Anyhow, uh, we had a great time in that conference and it closes this morning. So this service is the climax of that conference and they are online this morning with us. So uh, we wave to them. <laughs> so we appreciate everyone who is online and who is a part of that conference. So I'm giving you that explanation to say that the theme that we had and the passage that we were working in is this Acts chapter 4, which is from about verse uh, 7 or ver verse 5 down through and including verse 12. So I know that you have not been involved in all of that that has gone on before. So this is the kind of the climax. But so I don't want you to feel left out. And hopefully, uh, as we move into and deal with the climactic verse, which is uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, uh, this verse literally summarizes everything that he's been trying to say. So hopefully uh, you won't be left out in, in the uh, essence of truth and this message, message will stand on its own. Uh, the situation, of course, is uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, as you begin in chapter 3, there is a lame beggar, and he has been there for 40 years. The reason we know that uh, is because he's over 40 years of age, and he's a fixture at the temple. So this is not an outsider who's come in. We were there when he was born. We went with his parents. Jesus has walked by this guy. The disciples and apostles have walked by this guy. Uh, this guy is a fixture. Everybody in the temple and everybody in Jerusalem knows about this guy. He has the top begging spot. He's kind of outlived everybody else, outsurvived everybody else, so he has the top begging spot. And on this particular occasion, Peter and John come by, grab him by the hand, yank him to his feet, and say, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. So this guy has received a miracle. Now Luke just goes overboard. I can't tell you how overboard he goes in giving language. He uses about seven different languages and phrases to describe what happened to this guy. It wasn't just, oh, he was crippled, now he's not crippled. It wasn't just a physical thing. He uses words like wholeness. He uses words like made well. There was a psychological thing that was going on with the guy. Hey, he's had abuse all of his life. And now something has happened to him, not just physically, but when God does a job, he does a complete job. And he literally has gone through this boy with every with all the divine healing and has psychologically reversed the process, has healed him in his emotions and has literally brought him to his feet and he stands in Jesus totally, absolutely whole. It's a phenomenal miracle. All of Jerusalem is going crazy. See, there's no way to discredit this thing. Now, the Sadducees and Pharisees would like to do that, but hey, they can't because there he stands. I mean, what are you going to do with that thing? I mean, he's absolutely been made well, no question about it. And all of Jerusalem is talking about it, so it's no way to say, well, it didn't, it didn't, re it didn't really happen. Because it did happen, and there he stands. So they've got to deal with this thing. Now, Peter and John go with this guy. This guy he holds on to Peter like Peter is responsible for the miracle. So he, there, he's holding on to Peter, and they go into the Solomon's porch, and when they, uh, in the temple, and when they're there, a large crowd comes and says, oh, we want to see the miracle. So they all come to see this. And as they come, they're all looking at Peter, again, as if Peter is responsible for this. And Peter is abhorred by this. So he, 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 he turns to this crowd and says, whoa, guys, come on. No, 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 no. Don't, don't look at
look at me as if I did this. I did not do this. Hey, I'm just like you. I put my pants on one leg at a time just like you do. Hey, want to smell my feet? Hey, they smell like yours. Come on. I'm just like you. So don't, don't, don't put me, no. And then he begins to describe that all of this happened because of the man that they crucified called Jesus. And he gives Jesus the total, absolute credit. The man called Jesus. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one you crucified. That's the one. And he pinpoints it. Now, of course, the, the Sadducees are, are getting all bent out of shape because this is in the temple. And this kind of tips the scale in persecution. So all the persecution that's going to happen in the early church from this point on starts here. So this is a monumental scene. So the Sadducees come running out, grab this Peter and John and this guy, no doubt, throw them in jail. And they're in jail uh, for the night. They are bring them out the next morning and bring them before the Sanhedrin, 70 of the most powerful men of Israel, and they are going to interrogate them. Now what we're dealing with in this passage then is that this group, this 70 of the most powerful men of Israel, look at Peter and John and say, and ask this question. They, there's no chit-chat. There's no, well, how, did you have a good night? Uh, what was your breakfast like? Uh, there was none of that. They just move right into it. And in verse 7, they ask this question. By what power or by what name have you done this? Hey, we want to know about the power, and we want to know where the power came from. Who is the responsible person for this power? So that's, hey, lay it out for us. Did you have chance that you did? Is this some kind of mystical thing? Is this herbs that you ate? Is what, what, what's the deal? Where, where does all of this come from? We want it nailed down. Now, Peter is moved upon in verse 8 by the Spirit of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, it says, and he turned to them and he said, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for, this is verse 9, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well. See, you brought us into jail. You put us in jail. We would understand that if we did something bad. Hey, I deserve it. I got that. Hey, I was wrong. I got that. I did the bad thing. I got that. So I'm in jail because I did a bad thing. Everybody understands that. But we did a good thing. And you threw us in jail. So if you want to play that game, okay, he says. Verse 10, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone, Jesus is the stone, which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, look at verse 12 again. It's the climactic summary statement, if you please. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, no one can read this passage without coming up to the conclusion that Peter is presenting the idea that the total solution, that salvation, that everything you're looking for in religion, that all you're desiring in terms of holiness, righteousness, and being right in your own life. Forgiveness of sins and everything that you put into the category of spiritual life, that the solution, the answer, the supply, the source of that salvation is the person of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a Greek scholar and you go to the depth of this passage, you come to that conclusion. If you're a casual reader and you just read it once, you have to come to that. It is so bold. It is so absolutely straight on. It is so blaring in your face that there's no way to sidestep it. 
See, this is not buried and you have to dig to get it. This is on the surface blaring at you that he is saying, hey guys, nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which me what we must be saved. So there's no salvation outside of the person of Jesus Christ. That is so blaring and central in his, in his proposition. So if you have come to religion and saying, well, I'm looking for a new philosophy of our life, then you don't want to be here. Because this, as he says, is not about a philosophy, for, a philosophy for life. This is about a relationship with a person called Jesus. This is about the living Christ who's been raised from the dead and the spirit of that Christ literally coming to invest himself in you until you come under the influence in relationship with him and you and him have literally come together in this relationship which is way beyond philosophy. If you say, I'm looking for a new belief system. I want to straighten out my doctrine. You have come to the wrong place, he says. Because this is not about doctrine. This is not about belief systems. This is not about dotting the I's and, and crossing the T's. This is not about figuring it out. This is about, oh, there's Jesus. Oh, here I am. And somehow I literally move into a relationship with this person of Jesus that literally changes my life. And the whole deal is a relationship with the person of Jesus himself. Now, if you say, well, I'm looking for mental exercises, meditations, getting into the zone. If that's what you're looking for, this is the wrong place. Because this is not about meditation. This is about a living person who's functioning, moving, acting, mind, will, and emotion, is making decisions about you, feels about you, thinks about you, wants you, and you and him get together in a relationship and the living God literally merges with your life, moves within your flesh, and you and him in that relationship begin to operate day after day after day. And salvation, he says, is found in that relationship. Now, if you're looking for religious activities, oh, we can pile them on. We can get all kinds of things for you to do. Hey, we can get services for you to come to. We can get prayer activities for you to spend time. We can get chapters for you to read. We, we can get all kinds of religious activities. We can get candles for you to light, beads for you to count. We can get all kinds of activities for you to do. But if that's what you're after, you're on the wrong place. Because this is about an intimate relationship with the... Are you getting this? This is about an intimate relationship with this person of whether you know him, of whether he's, in, whether he's invaded your life, of whether you've come under the influence of his person, of whether he's enhancing who you are, whether you and him have gotten together and you're following his guidance, and whether you're in relationship with this living person. And everything in the passage comes back to this person. If you say, well, I'm just, I'm just scared about hell. I don't want to burn forever. Do you have a fire insurance for that? Yes, sign right here. And then when you die, you'll be okay. If that's what you're looking for, you're in the wrong place. Because this is not about a future thing. This is about a now thing. This is about an intimate relationship with the person of Jesus where you and him have literally come into the relationship and what you're going to experience in eternity, you're beginning to experience now. In fact, Paul calls it an earnest payment that the Spirit of God has literally come within you and you are experiencing within you now what you're going to experience in the eternities in heaven. And this is the reality of a relationship with this person. If you say, well, I just feel guilty and I just need some peace in my life and my home is all falling apart and I want it put back together. Again, you've come to the wrong place because this is not about counseling. This is not about straightening out your guilt complex. This is not about, hey, quit hanging your coat on the doorknob and she'll love you. That's not what this is about. See, this is about 
you and this person called Jesus coming into an intimate relationship, will that affect your home? Absolutely. Will that affect your guilt? He forgives. Will that give you peace? No question. But that's not the issue. The issue is, oh, it's him. It's him. It's him. It's this person of Jesus. You are falling in love with the person. And this person who already has fallen in love with you, who has created you, who has destiny for you, wants to literally infiltrate your life. And in that fusion of your life and his, whoa, you have a relationship with the living person of God. That is his whole premise. Now, you may say, well, I, that, that's not for me. Fine. But you got to, I don't even believe that's true. Fine. But you got to say, the Bible says that. See, the Bible says that. Well, that's too narrow. There's got to be other ways to heaven besides Jesus. If you want to believe that, that's fine. Go travel the other trails. It's okay. We won't get mad. But you got to say, well, but the Bible says. Peter said, and that Christianity is about this one single person by the name of Jesus. The second member of the Trinity who has literally become flesh and has confronted life, your life, and wants relationship with you and nothing else matters outside of your relationship with that living person. Now relationship, you understand, relationship is altogether different than rules. See, we understand rules. Well, I have to. Well, I got to. Well, if I don't, then I'll be punished. These rules. We understand rules. But relationship is different than that. You understand that. See, r rules are obligation. Rules are thumb in the back. Rules are, oh, brother. Rules are... But see, relationship is love. Relationship is passion. Relationship, see, rules are have to. Relationship is want to. See, rules are, oh, brother. Relationship is delight. See, rules are you don't cheat on your wife. Relationship is I don't want to cheat on my wife. <laughs> see, this relationship is about burn within. Relationship is about burning in your bones. Relationship is about, wow. Relationship is about focus. Relationship is all about, wow, I'm all wrapped up in. Relationship is about, about this passion of the inner soul. Rules are drag your feet, do what you're supposed to do, brother. See, it's an altogether different ball game. Now, is religion full of rules? Well, No, it's not. It's full of love and passion and burn. And I'd rather die than hurt Jesus. And it isn't about I do the right thing or don't do the, uh, and I don't do the wrong thing. It isn't about that. It's about I don't care whether it's right or wrong. I don't care if everybody in the whole world does it. If I sense that it's somehow it violates my relationship with him, I, it's out, man. I don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because that's relationship. That's the heart that beats and has passion for Christ. That's the burn in the bones, man. That, oh, I just love him so much I can't hardly stand it. That's why we talk about him all the time. So Peter is standing up before the Sanhedrin and saying, guys, you've been all wrapped up in rules. What now we have moved into is this, this relationship with this, with this living Christ and Jesus all salvation is found in relationship with this living person. That's the premise. Now, I want to take verse, 10, uh, verse 12, and I want to analyze it with you. And I want to go through the verse to show you how exclusive this is, how, how narrow this is, how absolutely pointed this idea is in the passage itself. So look with me at verse 12. Number one, we're going to talk about exclusively exclusive. Now, he starts out in verse 12 and says, nor is there salvation in any other. Now, put that phrase right over here. That's an independent clause. In other words, it has a verb, 
and it has a subject and a verb, and it stands on its own. You don't need anything else but that. That stands on its own. That's a sentence. Nor is there salvation in any other. There it is. Then, over here, he gives a second independent clause. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So you got two distinct, independent clauses, complete sentences, making bold statements. Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Two distinct statements. Now let's take this statement over here. Nor is there salvation in any other. Now in my translation, obviously, the the first word in the passage is the word nor. Nor is there salvation, which, ha- which presents the negative idea. Now it's interesting that the word nor there is a translation of two Greek words. One is the word and. So literally it starts out with a conjunction and. In other words, what I'm going to tell you in verse 12 I'm, is linked It's not different. It's linked. It's not a new deal. It's linked. It's connected to verse 11 and verse 10. What's verse 11? In this is the stone, meaning Jesus. Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So what's he saying? He's saying there's this house, and we're building this house. And the whole structure of the house hangs on this foundational cornerstone. And the cornerstone that was meant for the house was rejected by the builders. So the house won't stand. But God superseded the builders and took this chief cornerstone called Jesus and put him at the foundational center point of the structure of the house. So salvation is a house that rests exclusively on the person of Jesus Christ. So if you're going to be in the house, you're going to be standing in Jesus. Because Jesus is the very essence of the structure of the house itself. Now, that also is connected with verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. So here's the lame beggar who's been healed standing right there. Peter looks at him and says, that guy right there is standing in the house. That's why he's not at the gate beautiful in crippled state. That's why he's been made whole. His wholeness is because he's in the house. He's in Jesus. He's inside Jesus, and Jesus is inside him, and that gives him wholeness. So the wholeness that this man experiences, is experiencing, is Jesus. And the house is erected upon Jesus. So the salvation house is structured in Jesus. Therefore, and... So he's linking this passage with everything he said, which is Jesus, Jesus. Now, it's going to be more Jesus. You can count on it. So, in verse 12, you have the word, starts with the word and. Then, in the word nor is and, but one other word. Not, which is the negative. And not, he says. So that makes a negative approach. But here's the interesting thing. This is not hard now. Here's the interesting thing. The Greek word for not is the word ouk, O-U-K. But there's another word for not, which is M-E, may. So you got ouk, you got may. Both of them can be translated not. But they're not the same. They're not the same, not used the same. See, may is a dependent negative. Ouk is an independent negative. In other words, may is your opinion. Depends on your opinion. I do not want anchovies on my pizza. I will not. That's may. Why? That's your opinion. Other people love anchovies on their pizza. So that's up for grabs. I think 
She, I, I do not believe she is ugly. That's your opinion. Other people think she's... <laughs> so it's an opinion. That's me. That's a dependent. Depends on your opinion. But see, there are other situations where it's not dependent upon your opinion. It's ook, which is not. I will jump off this building and I will not go down. You're going down, son. <laughs> it's just not a matter of opinion. I mean, you can think what you want to think, but I'm telling you, you're going down. Because it is beyond your opinion. It's bigger than your opinion. It's not based on your opinion. Now, the, the, the word he uses here is ook, which is, it's not your opinion. This is not my opinion. This is not your opinion. This is not Peter's opinion. Well, that they, yeah, that the disciples thought that. But no, this is not. Well, well, I don't agree. Fine. But you have to, what Peter is stating here is that this is bigger, ladies and gentlemen, than the opinion of a person or the opinion of a religion or opinion of a philosopher or an opinion of a teacher. This goes beyond the opinion and is an absolute certainty. What I'm telling you, you about salvation being in the person of Jesus is beyond well that's what that church believes that there are other churches that's fine but I'm telling you this you're going down <laughs> see this is not 99% but then there's a little no this is do you see how narrow this is you're telling me then that outside of the person of Jesus and a relationship with him, nobody, any place, anywhere, under any circumstances, has a chance of being saved. Well, I don't believe that, Manly. Fine. But you've got to say the Bible says that. That's what Peter's saying. See how narrow that is? That there's no wiggle room in that? There's no way around it? That that is dead on? That is so pinpointed? That this issue of Jesus, and we've talked about this a lot, the issue of Jesus is so strong in the Scriptures that what you're getting in the Scriptures, what you're, the heart of Christianity is not about, come on, not about activities, not about Doctrines, not about belief systems, not about reformation, not about, well, I'll quit that, start this, that, forget that, will you please? And will you just, he says, come into a relationship with this person of Jesus, which is, which is the heart of everything that God wants for humanity. And that is very, very narrow. Now, on top of that, Look at verse 12 again. We're dealing with this phrase over here. Nor is there salvation in any other. Now the word any is very interesting there. So we started out with and not. Is there salvation in any? Now the word any is two words put together. And guess what? It's the word ook, which is the absolute independent not and the word one and it could be translated not even one not even one well you just got done saying that <laughs> see he wants you to get this you talk about me repeating my sermons whoa this guy is full of it so the whole message that he proposes is and not is there salvation not in even one other? And the other is Jesus. So ladies and gentlemen, this is, well manly, I'd be embarrassed to stand up and say that. I'm sorry, I'm not embarrassed because I've meant him. And he is so phenomenal. He is so, whoa, he is so... Jesus is so, 
Whatever you think, I'm telling you, Jesus is so far beyond what you think. Jesus is so much greater than, but when we talk about he loves you, you have no concept of it. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's so much beyond the words. When I'm telling you Jesus is great, that doesn't, that, it doesn't even come close. There, see, there's no way to describe this that God himself who created you came up with this plan and the Trinity God launched the redemptive plan in the person of Jesus. God became man and this person of Jesus is the exclusive heart of God who wants to enter into relationship with you and salvation is found there. In fact, uh, let me give you number two, that's the first one, the exclu uh, exclusively exclusive. Number two, exceptionally exclusive. Now let's go back to the first phrase. Nor and not is there salvation in not even one other. Now the word other is really interesting. And again, in the Greek language, this other thing, you, you get, there's two words for other. There's the word allos and the word heteros. Allos, heteros. And both of them can be other, but they're not the same. See, allos is one of the same kind. Heteros is one of a different kind. For instance, I say to you, as I eat this apple, and it drips from my, the juice drips from my chin, and I finally finish it and eat the core too, I turn to and pick the, my teeth with the, with the stem. I turn to you and say, wow, that was really good. I'm going to go get another. So I go into the kitchen and I come out with a banana. That's heteros. I got another fruit, but of a different kind. But if I'd have gone in and got the same apple, same kind of apple, and came out, that would be aloes. It's one of the same kind. Now the word here is allos. In other words, what is he saying? He is saying, you got to get this, he is saying, and not, ook, not a matter of opinion, beyond opinion, and not, not, no opinion, is there salvation, not even one, not in even one other. In other words, there is no one of the same kind as Jesus. Nobody compares. Now here, I'm not here to knock other religions. Wow, God bless you. But I'm telling you, there isn't anything in the world that compares to this. Hey, you can study Muslimism, you can study Hinduism, you can study anything you want to study. And I'm telling you, there's some, that Christianity is a category all by itself. Well, don't world religions all have common denominators? Yes, but Christianity is so radically different than everything else that it's in a category. In fact, we try to promote the idea, which is true, that Christianity is not a religion. Because religion is man's search for God. Christianity is God has searched for you, which is a whole different ball game. And that's all found in the person of Jesus. I fell in love with the uh, Native Americans. Wanted to be one, but... Uh, and we spent a lot of time in uh, New Mexico. Uh, we had a... Uh, the Church of the Nazarene had a school out there for Native Americans and a uh, ministerial school. And we taught in that school and fell in love with the Native Americans and spent a lot of time with them. And it's interesting. I never have met a Native American who didn't have a feel, didn't have a, a tendency towards spirituality. In other words, they were so aware of the spirit world. I mean, it's just, I never met one that didn't have they just got all wrapped up in materialism and physical things and 
hey, did have no. No, they all had some kind of connection with the spiritual world. But it's interesting, see. There's this great spirit of the sky. Okay. We're worshiping the spirit of the sky. All right. There is this spiritual force out there. Okay. The spirit of the sky. All right. What does he look like? I don't know. How does he feel? I'm not sure. What does he do? Well, can't figure it out. Has that spirit of the sky ever said, I love you so much, I'm going to come out of the sky and I'm going to enter into a woman's womb and I'm going to set every advantage I have as, as the spirit of the sky aside and I'm going to enter into a woman's womb and I'm going to literally sacrifice myself, die for you and go to hell and pay for your entire penalty so you can be free. Did that spirit of the sky ever do that? Well, no. Will you show me another religion that even comes close to that kind of love and passion and redemption? Well, there isn't one. See, this is in a category all by itself, folks. In fact, it is in a category all by itself. Come on, follow this. This is in a category all by itself so high and so above everything else that we couldn't have made this one up. See, who on earth would have come up with this idea? I mean, if you were going to sit down at a table and come up with the idea of religion, what kind of idea would you come up with? Well, you need to come every Sunday morning and you need to put money in the offering plate. See, that's what we would come up with. See, this is not... You would come up with a God who has requirements and you got to do this, 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 and this. That's what you'd come up with, right? What is this all about? God who says, hey, don't do anything. I'm going to do it for you. You don't have to redeem yourself. I'm coming after you. And a God who is absolutely so passionately in love with you that he would sacrifice his whole... i got to settle down and get on. But the, whoa, do you see that? This is so unique, ladies and gentlemen, that it's just... It's just off the wall. It's, it's, it's out of sight. It's so far beyond. It's, it's so unreasonable. It doesn't, make to, it doesn't make sense to the human thought process. Because who would, why would God, why would he love me? See, that's one of our big problems. Why would God want me? So you may want to say, well... I, I just don't buy it, Manly. Fine. But you got to say the Bible says this. This is what Christianity is all about. And there is no other like this. So you know what Peter is saying? And not is there salvation, not in even any other. Because there's no one in his category. That's that statement. Now we're halfway through. <laughs> Relax. Now, over here is the second statement. That would be enough, wouldn't it? Over here is the next statement. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, this is the second independent clause. And we're calling this experientially exclusive. And it's interesting. For he says, there is no. Again, a negative. Now, the word no is two words put together. Guess what? Ook. This independent not. Not a matter of opinion. It's not, well, you think that, I think this, it's okay. That's may. This is not. This is, hey, you're going down, boy. Well, you think you are or not? You're going down. Why? Because this is gravity is not a matter of opinion. So this is not a matter of opinion. And then it's the so this word no is two words put together. It's it's ook, which is not, and the contrasting conjunction but. So he says, what I want to do is I want to contrast 
what I've been telling you. So he says, look at this, for there is no other. Well, we just dealt with the word other. I know. Allos, I know. One of the same kind. So Jesus is in a category uh, uh, all by himself because there is no other kind like him. Now the word here is heteros, which is of a different kind. So I go into the kitchen, want another. I, I want, I've just eaten an apple. I want another. I go into the kitchen, come out with a banana. That's this word. So he says, let's look at Jesus. He's in a category all by himself. There's no other in the category. Now let's look at all the other categories. Let's go outside the category that he is exclusively in. Let's go outside that category and look at all the other categories. And you know what you find? There is no other category given among men. There isn't any of a different kind. Well, Manly, this works for you. This works for me. Fine. Help yourself. But I'm telling you, he says there is absolutely no salvation outside of intimacy with this person, of knowing this Jesus, of involvement with this Christ, of coming under the influence of this person. That salvation is exclusively 100%, absolutely. I'm talking, ook, you're going down, boy. There's n this is the reality of the thing, that outside of the person of Jesus, you cannot. Well, I'm a good person. Doesn't count. Well, I go to church all the time. Doesn't count. Well, I pray a lot. Doesn't count. Well, hey, I count beads. Doesn't count, man. I like candles. Doesn't count. Well, I gave the preacher $50. That counts. <laughs> See, nothing counts, folks. Nothing counts. Nothing counts. But this relationship with Jesus. Okay, manly, so what? Oh, well, hey, I want you in a relationship with Jesus. I want you to know him. I want you to meet him. I want you to have him. He wants you. I want you to walk up here and shake his hand. Get acquainted with him. Well, I already know him. Okay, well, get to know him better. I want you to go deeper. I want you to let your life come under his influence. I want you to realize the reality of who he is and the uniqueness of his person. And I want you to just literally embrace him. I want you to focus on him. I want you to literally, day after day after day, focus on him. I want you to go to bed with him. I want you to get up in the morning with him. I want him to be involved in all your conversation. I want you and him to literally face every obstacle in your life together. I want every thought process, every time you come up to something and you think about it, I want you to involve him in, his, in your thought process. When I'm making a decision, I want you to let him be involved in the situation and in the decision. I want your whole life to come under the relationship of this person called Jesus. Well, mainly if I did that, what would you call me? <gasps> Christian. You'd be a Christian. Christ John. So if you say, well, mainly, what is a Christian? One who has a relationship with Jesus. Wow, Jesus. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't say it well enough. I didn't say it loud enough. I didn't paint you in a big enough picture the beauty of who you are and the reality of your presence and what you want to do in the human life. I haven't portrayed it 
good enough? Would you come and paint your own picture on our heart today? Because the only, the only thing I can walk away with in this service that will give me any consolation at all is that we have literally just spoken your name and that you are literally by the power of your presence and spirit are going to attach yourself to every single person in this place and you are going to attach yourself to them and you are just literally going to pester them with your presence and pester them with your love and leech out and embrace them with yourself and you are going to pull them into your presence because you want them. And if you do that, that will be sufficient. So you're going to have to do your own revelation, Jesus. You're going to have to come to us. You're going to have to embrace us. And Lord, with all the stuff we face, with all the obstacles in our lives, with all the stuff that's going down in our culture in this hour, with all the virus and all the stuff that, and jobs and families and all the complications of our living, Jesus, where do we turn? Counting beads isn't good enough. Lighting candles doesn't do it. I don't need a great spirit in the sky. I need you, the one who came out of the sky, the one who took on flesh, the one who died and rose from the dead for me, and the one who wants to give the very essence of your nature to live within me and to saturate my mind and to influence me. And Lord, I want to bow at your feet today. I want to come under your influence and under your control. And I want to know who you are. Reveal yourself to me. And I will be saved. Heads are bowed. Would you join me in that? Would you seek him? Would you distinctly, on purpose, give yourself to him today? Would you, in the midst of all the anxieties and all the upsets and all the complications that are facing your life, would you plow your way through them and say, I'm seeking one solution, the intimacy of his presence, the wisdom of his mind, the throb of his heart, the livingness of who he is and all of his glory, the beauty of his person. Would you be Christian and its reality? So just a moment, just, just a moment, our altar's open just a moment for us to seek this one in a category all by himself and we've looked at all the other categories and they don't match up and we're coming back to the category of this one Jesus there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved moments of seeking